Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Nathalie Ferrier, I'm Higgins Art Gallery Director. And before we start, I would like to tell you a couple of things. First of all, that the event is being recorded. Uh, and then uh, if you have questions today, we I'm, I'm about to introduce uh, our wonderful artist, Robin Joyce Miller. But before we start, uh, please use the Q&A function for your questions whenever you have a question. And, Robin will answer all your questions at the end. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce the artist and poet, Robin Joyce Miller. We are so lucky to have Robin Joyce Miller with us to celebrate Black History Month. So her exhibit will be on view until March 18 at Higgins Art Gallery, Cape Cod Community College. And I'm about to write the hours um, of the uh, gallery hours in, uh, in the chat. I hope you, have, you will have time to stop by to see your work and um, um, maybe you will have more comments for Robin after you see the exhibit. So Robin Joyce Miller is a retired educator, artist, poet, and public speaker. She has taught for 30 years in the New York City school system. She spent the first half of her career teaching learning disabled students and the next half as an art teacher. Miller was also an NYC blueprint for the arts facilitator leading workshops at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum. Since her retirement, she and her husband have been living between New York City and Cape Cod. After George's Floyd murder, Robin and her husband James began presenting a Black Lives Matter series with the Cotwood Center for the Arts. So Robin is also on the board of, direct, of directors at the Cotwood Center. So it's my, my treat you know, to welcome you, Robin, and thank you so much for taking us uh, on this journey with you. Thank you, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be asked by you and by the Cape Cod Community College to be a part. Uh, I enjoyed our reception that we had. Um, that was so much fun meeting people, even the president of the college who decided to come um, so I'm, 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 I'm delighted to be here. And I think that uh, the reason, let me just tell you a little bit of why I do this. I do this because um, I believe that white supremacy has had an effect on my spirit and my soul all my life. And it is the fuel that keeps me going, telling our story proving to myself first that we are a people of value. And that has been a difficult journey for me personally. And in fact, I often call my work that I'm doing, it has been restoring my African soul. So um, I call the, certainly our journey, I call it the faithful journey because so many African-Americans have been faithful, religion has played, and Christianity has played a major role in our advancement in, in the struggle, even though Christianity has suppressed many people, it has also lifted up the spirits of our people. And so you will hear in my work uh, a sense of faithfulness, as well as history, poetry, um, some joy, uh, certainly some things have happened that have been joyful. And so actually we can begin with our slideshow. Now come and journey with us across the vast Atlantic Ocean to the beautiful coast of West Africa where the land is lush with green vegetation, where water cascades gently down from the mountain tops, where human bodies do the work of machines 
while exercising strength, balance, and movement, often done with style, elegance, and grace. Where creativity abounds in so many forms, the making of beads, the process of printing symbolic images that reveal the age old wisdom of its people, the weaving of a rich and decorative cloth known as kente, and the carving of sculptures. It is a land where walls tell stories of unspeakable truths. As people of African heritage, it is the land of our ancestors. We will journey together from the pits of the slave dungeons in Ghana to an amazing rise of a person of African descent who becomes leader of the free world today. You will view narrative quilts that honor the faithful journey of African-American people. Let us begin. Journey to hell. The slaves, the slaves, are we up to 17? Okay. Journey to hell. The slaves walked three to four months from the interior to the coast. In the quilt, you see the disturbing parade of captives as they journey to the slave castles. They stayed in filthy, dark, cold, damp dungeons until they were shipped out to the Americas. During our trip to Ghana, we visited Elmina Castle and Cape Coast Castle. Each had a door of no return. This door led the captives from the wretched dungeons into the daylight of a new and dreadful reality. Goodbye, Africa. Hello, slave ships and then the unknown. In Middle Passage Cargo, I am speaking to my ancestors who I was once painfully ashamed of due to my own ignorance. This poem is one of reconciliation. Middle Passage Cargo. Knowing your struggle, feeling your pain, knowing from whence you came, gives me faith in God up above, gives me truths I can claim. Knowing they tried to peel off your pride with hatred, with bondage, insane. But watching you rise above malice and lies gives me strength to walk proud without shame. Knowing your faith and your fortitude, knowing that I come from you, gives me great courage and I understand there's nothing that I cannot do. The plantation quilt is next. The plantation quilt, like many of my quilts, is full of visual rhythms. Visual rhythms are created by a repetition of lines, shapes, and colors. The repetition creates a sense of movement. The eye moves around the big house, demonstrating the hard work that needed to be done by enslaved people to maintain and support the opulent lives of the plantation owners. The poem that I'm about to do was inspired by a Russian student in my class who told two dark brown twin sisters that she had pure blonde hair, not like other girls in the school with dirty blonde hair. The word pure haunted me for days. And when I looked at the people in the plantation quilt, I wrote this poem and you'll hear the music near the cross. Born to a world where white is pure, where black is soot and dirt, 
yet you work with dignity, with pride, with grace, though your heart is heavy with hurt. Born to a world where white is pure, where blackness has little worth, but God plants his seeds in dirt called soil, a soil that nurtures and feeds the earth. Born to a world where white is pure, where you struggle just to survive. Know that your harvest is near. Toil in faith, have no fear. Soon you will flourish and thrive. The Underground Railroad Legend quilt is the next one. In this quilt, I created a border using patched symbols from original Underground Railroad quilts. It is a legend quilt because it has never been proven that people used quilts to actually escape. You see the Henry Box Brown, there's a quilt, of, there's a box and Henry Box Brown mailed himself to abolitionists. You also see the forest there where um, the enslaved people ran through the forest. You see the, um, a barrel where people hid at the bottom. You see a chimney, um, slaves hid in the chimneys. You see a candle, which was a, an indication that it was a safe house. You see a barn where they hid in barns and haystacks. You see, a, you see a safe house. You see a church and under the stairs. And in the middle, you see Harriet Tubman and the North Star leading them out. Okay, this quilt shows, uh, and we're doing the next one. This quilt shows the history of Juneteenth Day, which marks the last official day of slavery ending in Galveston, Texas. People had been talking about the Emancipation Proclamation, but since there were no emails, text messages, Twitter, Facebook, or even television or radio, slave owners were trying to hang on to their property as long as they could. Confederate soldiers occupied Ashton Villa. President Lincoln since sent Major General Gordon Granger to run off the Confederacy and deliver the news. Many things brought, and now we're, I think we're on, uh, yes, the great, the great migration. We should be on that one, 23. Ah, yes. Many things brought on the great migration. Black folks were not moving up north because they wanted to see the beautiful white snow. These folks knew of pain and suffering. They knew they needed somewhere else to go. They told of their struggles, they told of their pain in those lilting melodies of the Negro spiritual. And let me just tell you something. When I do my work, I often listen to Negro spirituals. I, I used to like in particular to listen to Alvin Ailey's Revelations. And um, one of the pieces that they played was I've been buked and I've been scorned. And so when I thought about why the African-Americans left the South, I heard that music in my head. And I would, in fact, when I'm in the museum, I start singing it a little bit. I don't have the best singing voice, but I'll give you a little bit if you don't know. I've been buked. And I've been scorned, and it goes on. Yes, I've been buked and I've been scorned. So that's a Negro spiritual and it speaks of the pain. And so when I wrote the poem for this one, that was my inspiration. And I'm going to do that for you now. Head north, been so buked, been so scorned, head north sure as I was born. Ain't no jobs, ain't nothing fair. Bow weevils, floods everywhere. Want no part, no gym, no crow. Can't pick no cotton, not no mo. Seen some folks are hanging, got me looking in the skies. Where you at, Lord Jesus? Can't you hear our mournful cries? 
Got to get me a ticket. Got to get us on a train. Get my family to somewhere, somewhere that be sane. Been so beautiful. Been so scorned, head north, sure as I was born. Thank you. And then we come to the Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so, okay, I think we had enough pain and we're gonna move on because this was a beautiful time of joy and, and, and renewal. Um, so uh, 6 million African-Americans left the South, the rural South to the urban Northeast, Midwest and West between 1910 and 1970. One of those places was Harlem, New York, where the talented 10th reigned supreme and joints were jumping with jazz. Just wanna say, um, I did a whole uh, show, Black Music Matters, the culture of jazz, where I really talk about um, the music, the period of jazz, and many of the people in this quilt, Alelia Walker, um, uh, James Vanderzee, uh, Langston Hughes, the work of William H. Johnston, um, Bojangles, and um, just what was going on during that period. So I hope that at some point you will look at Black Music Matters. And now we'll move to the Civil Rights Movement quilt. I grew up during this time. My father attended the March on Washington with many men from our neighborhood. My mother, brother, and I sat in front of our black and white televisions listening to Dr. King's every word. We also spent some time trying to spot dad in the crowd. And that was really hopeless and help. <laughs> that did not happen, but we were looking for my father. Um, and now we go to the journey quilt. I was working on the journey quilt on January 20th, 2009 while Barack Hussein Obama was being sworn in as the 44th president of the United States of America. As I looked back on the journey of my people, I teared up and was most proud to go from that first middle passage patch to an African-American family with the presidential seal was absolutely remarkable and the work of a mighty God. So this was, I was so excited to do this one. And I said, oh, I've got to put this together. This is an opportunity. And um, my husband actually did the poem for this. If we have some time, I might do some of those other poems for you as well. Anyway, let's move to the inauguration day. And in, in the museum, I usually go, and do the stars and stripes forever. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, um, people all over the country went to this historical inauguration. They came with their children. They came with their parents and even grandparents. They came with joy and they came with tears. They came from near and they came from far. They came by train, by car and by plane. And like the million, like the March on Washington, the buses came rolling in. They came and they came and they came to witness the first African-American take the oath of office to become the 44th president of these United States of America. I wrote a poem to honor and remember that day. So to write the poem, I actually went on the video and revisited everything and took notes. And that's how I came up with this poem. And in the museum, I have people um, holding up their fists. And so I'm going to do this with you. Obama, Obama, a day to scream and shout. Obama, Obama, massive crowds came out. The trumpets bellowed loudly. The bells rang through the air. Pomp and circumstance were felt, just magic everywhere. People waved their flags about the red, the white, the blue. Echoes of a dream once heard, sweet victory come true. Prayers were lifted, speeches made, then our girl Aretha came to sing. From every mountainside we know, let peace and freedom ring. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. 
of thee I sing. Obama's oath was taken, hail to the chief was played. The cannons fired through the air, out rolled his motorcade. They cruised past waving people. You heard more screams and shouts. God bless our first black family en route to the White House. Glory, hallelujah. I heard our forefathers sing from every mountainside we know. Let peace and freedom ring. Thank you. And actually, I think I'll do another. Um, I'm working on a play and I'm talking about uh, white privilege and we're talking about what white privilege has done for, um, for to black people and to white people. It has done a disservice to us all. And um, a woman who, one woman wrote this poem about wondering as the descendant of slave owners, how her family with their beautiful house, how they benefited from it. And so I, who was doing, um, I did my DNA, whoops, excuse me. I did my DNA and I can actually say that I came up with, um, 13 of my grandparents' grandparents. Out, each of us has four grandparents. So each of my grandparents have four grandparents. So that would give 16. Out of 16, I can name 13 of them. One of them, most of them were born during slavery. Some were born like just right on the, the edge on the, you know, on the border of that time. But um, when I did this, I decided to write this poem to uh, talking about my grandparents. And the name of the poem is, and this is my first time ever doing it for anyone. Grandparents of my grandparents is the name of the poem. Lewis Bowers, Mary Addison, Martin Goethe, Eliza Goethe, John Washington, Joanna Daniels Washington, Abraham Booz, Sally Booz, Joe Bunch, Cressy Bunch, Louise German, Archie Love, Mary Love. Grandparents of my grandparents. I've searched your spirits among the stars looking for signs of you. My skin, my lips, my nose, my hair carry DNA. I know you're there. I know your names, birth dates, and places too. South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, plantations all claimed you. Descendants of Africa, your blood flows from the tribes that shaped your brilliance, your cultural pride. Nothing you owned, no material gains. Slave owners only gave you their names. But you brought a wealth that America claims. Oh, grandparents of my grandparents and your parents as well. African intelligence skills, oh, do tell. Your creative minds, your talented, uh oh, sorry, your talented, and I can't read the, the, the ink came off, but. No land, no wealth, no material gains, nothing you owned, nothing you claimed. We, as your children, ask how you survived. We learned that through struggle, you even thrived. Tenacity, fortitude, courage, and faith. Your God and his mercy, your God and his grace. So that, so that is the legacy in my DNA. I'm grateful, I love you. For your past, I pray that I can live to make you proud, that I can shout your names out loud. I carry your hopes, I carry your dreams, and I will always know that I am because you were. So today I thank you, grandparents of my grandparents and your parents too. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I messed that up. Uh, the pages, the, 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 the ink didn't roll off and I didn't realize that. So, 
Thank you so much, Robin. So now I have a question for you. I would like to know what kind of materials and what is your process? Because we, we have seen a lot of you beautiful, colorful quilts, but um, seeing them on the screen, people don't really know what they are made of. Okay. So let me tell you, um, the, the quilts that are in, in the gallery, in the Higgins gallery, those are my early quilts. So those quilts are basically just paper and paint. Today, I do much more. For example, I'm working on something now and I, I use, whoops, some, it's not all together, but I use metals and I use um, uh, metals and, and cloth and I use uh, beads and I use stones. And I you, use, you wanna, can uh, you lift it wait, up? I know, oh, here, oh, I, I know. See, the problem is it's not finished and it's falling apart. But here you can see, <laughs> I, I, this is, this is um, I have little beads here. I have stones here. I have African cloth here. I have a kind of grass things that I got from uh, Michael's that I put in the work. I use um, um, all, whatever. I use anything and everything that I can find that will stick onto my canvases. So today it's very different. In fact, I don't, you're not gonna see as many things behind um, glass. For example, in my Ethiopian Jesus, this is, I use model magic, by the way, as an art teacher, here is model magic, okay? And I use this material to um, to make I made the bread on my uh, on this um, canvas on, uh, for the uh, the bread in the Last Supper I I made it out of model magic which is a clay and then I paint it so I use everything now I've got all kinds of materials all beads and jewelry and so, so are you, are you behind here, I'm going to do this behind me I have all of this stuff. I've got lots of things that uh, materials that I use to create my art. So, are, are you working on a new series? Like you, you yes, I am. Yes, yes I what, am. Because, what, is, what is it about? Okay. Tell us more. So um, my next show is going to be about the kingdoms of Africa. And in I'm giving you a peek into that. So when we talk about, when I talk about Africa and its kingdoms, I'm also going to talk about the fact that civilization began in Africa. I do a lot of research to do that. In fact, let me just, I'm going to show you this one second. I look at lots of tapes. I look, I, I do a lot of studying before this one, this is kingdoms of Africa. So when I do my work, I look at um, Henry Louis Gates, I read books, I go on to videos, I do a lot of research. Um, and I like to use, if you saw my last work that we just did, which was Black Art Matters. And um, I talked about African-American artists, but I always like to bring poets and other imp important voices, not just my voice and my husband's voice. But in the last one, for example, I did um, I, I had uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou. So it's important that I bring in popular, famous people who have, who have said, who, who, whose quotes are amazing and important. So in this next one, when I do the creation, I'm doing the creation um, and saying that the world began in Africa, but I'm using um, James Weldon Johnson's version of the creation. And so now I am illustrating uh, the creation using an African style. So as I talk about the sun and I look at the earth and we talk about the sky and lightning bolts and I'm using African designs to create that. So that's my next work that I'm, I'm working on and looking into. Great. And so when we were talking, you, you told me that um, at first you were interested um, by making art, but you were not considering yourself like an artist. But because you were teaching 
uh, it's something that kind of came along with the teaching. So would you like to talk a little sure. bit about that? Okay, well, first of all, I grew up in a house with my father who was an artist, but my father had issues and he believed that he liked being the singular artist. And he made it seem like, I always grew up thinking that God granted certain people these gifts, but they, I'd never understood that they could be passed in DNA, that I could possibly have his gift within me. And so my you, father didn't dad, really- you, Was your dad a painter? My father was an artist. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So he made his living as an artist, not painting. He wasn't the best painter um, artist. He was a graphic illustrator and he worked for companies doing more technical illustration. So he was a technical illustrator. And um, I used to look at his hands and think that he had magical hands. And in truth, I never imagined that I could be an artist. He was the only artist that I knew. And there were no, in our neighborhood, in my church, he was the church artist. He was the artist at my school. He used to do the sets for my plays. And so since I didn't know other artists and I, I just thought he, he was one of the singular people. So in, I didn't imagine myself. It wasn't until um, I became a teacher and started drawing because I had to, that people said, hey, you can draw. And as I did illustrations, especially in social studies, my learning disabled students were struggling with understanding social studies. And I was illustrating some of the chapters and having them do the drawings because many of them were wonderful artists, but I was drawing on the board first, giving them ideas and doing things. I realized I loved it. I also realized that by reading the, um, the history and, and illustrating it, the history became more interesting to me. But I was never a history buff. Until I started studying, after, during my sabbatical was when I decided to take up art. And um, uh, after 15 years of teaching special education, I took an, a sabbatical to study art. I came back as the art teacher. And then I started researching artists and looking and drawing and studying African-American history through art and creating these quilts. So they became like, oh, this was all about teaching myself. So each time I did a quilt, I learned more about the Harlem Renaissance to do a Harlem quilt, to do, to talk about the civil war. I had to read these things to talk about what was happening during Juneteenth to talk about slavery. I had to do research and then figure out what I'm going to illustrate. And so it became an exciting project for me. And so it, it has never died out in me. So I see myself as the person who does art simply to tell my story to, um, I'm not the artist who's trying to sell my work anymore. I'm, I'm really just, this is my narrative. My story quilts are my narrative and, and it's for me. It heals me. It tells me who we are as a people. And every time I do something, it's an achievement. It's a personal, it's just personal. And if other people can appreciate it and enjoy it, I'm happy, but I'm really doing it for my soul. Were you students uh, African-American, white? Um, no, if you heard in, no, 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 no. I was one of the few black teachers in my school. My school had everyone in the world. So my school had less African-Americans than other students. So um, I had students from every continent. I had students from South America. I had students from Sweden. In fact, the one where I did Middle Passage Cargo, that was a Russian student, um, Sasha Skorobova Katova, okay? She was yes. the one who spoke to two black students. So I had students from Mexico. In fact, my, my school was really a microcosm of the world. So you had children from India. I had children from Mali. A little girl used to say, Mrs. Mila, can you speak French to me? And I said, I would say to her, bonjour. And then I would say, I looked at her art and said, très joli, très joli. And she would get so happy that she heard her language. So children came from all over the world 
probably because my school was very near um, a hospital, Einstein, which is a research hospital. So we had lots of Asian, we had every Asian group from Thailand to Vietnam, to Japan, to um, um, Korea. We had every, China, you had everyone. So I was blessed to be in a, surrounded by people from everywhere. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask our audience if uh, they would have any question for you, because I, I don't see any right now in the chat. So um, if someone wants to ask Robin a question, uh, you can either type it in the chat, you can type it in the Q&A by, um, you know, at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button. So let, let us know uh, your questions. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. I think um, that's the beauty of New York, you know, when everybody yes. comes yes. together and, and creates that dynamic, extraordinary and, community. And that and is why I decided to speak, to learn to speak Spanish, because a lot of the population who spoke Spanish, I knew that was going to be the easiest language for me to learn. I wasn't going to speak Chinese. French, I only knew, I know about 10 words, you know, um, and <laughs> I can say bonjour, au revoir, excuse-moi, s'il vous plaît, um, you know, and um, think a few things, but um, here's something, is that one? Yes, so, so there's, a, there's a question from uh, Stéphane. Hi, Stéphane, thank you for being with us today. So uh, Stéphane says, with Black Lives Matter and the heavy load of racism within the US society, has this been an influence in your recent work? Oh, absolutely. Um, the whole series, the Black Lives Matter series is because of what has happened. So that is why, and in fact, that's when I started doing more reading, um, all the different books that have come out on white fragility, um, 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 all the books on race, you know, that I'm reading. And so um, it's inspiring my work, but that is why, Katuit's Center for the Arts asked me to do the Black Lives Matter series. And so that is why I'm doing, that's why, that's really the fact that someone asked me to do this work and it's encouraging me and inspiring me. And it says here, have you traveled a lot in Africa or Latin America? Okay, I unfortunately, I have never gone to Latin America. And I want to, because that's where, um, uh, that's, you know, I speak a little Spanish, so I would love to go there. Um, Africa, I've gone twice with my church. And in fact, you can see in my, if you go to my Black Churches Matter, all you have to do is go to Robin Joyce Miller Art, go to my website and click on about, and you'll see about Black Lives Matter series. You can look at any of the shows, but in the Black Churches Matter. I show one of my trips to Africa where I went to Ghana and my husband and I renewed our vows on top, our 30 year vows, anniversary vows on Elmina Castle wearing African clothing, Ghanaian clothing. But I went there, I, so I went in 2010 was the second trip. I went in 2006, I went to South Africa um, and Swaziland. I went to Nelson Mandela's um, uh, he, his cell. I went to Robben Island. I went to um, a, a lot of South Africa. So I've been to Africa twice and my brother's been to Ethiopia, um, but I have not traveled. And these days I don't, I don't plan on doing a lot of traveling with the pandemic and what's going on. And I see another question. Where can we see your black art series? Okay, I love the grandparents poem. Oh, thank you so much. Um, um, and that is Karen Watson. Okay, um, well, I, as I said, you can see my series by going, it's on Katuit On Demand, but if you go to my website, Robin Joyce Miller, and, and it might, it'll come up. And these days you can go on Robin Joyce Miller and hit videos and you can see some of them. But if you go to my website, the whole collection is there together. And we we improved as we got, as we went on, we got better and learned the technology a little better. 
And so um, I think that answers your question where you can see the work. Great. And it looks like that's it, right? Yes, I think that's it. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, I want to thank Robin <laughs> so much. Uh, I, I want to remind everybody, come to the gallery, um, come to see the, the tapestries. You know, I like to think of them as tapestries uh, because they, they really look like uh, they were made out of fabric. Uh, they are really beautiful. They are huge. I think uh, you will be amazed by their size. Um, so come to visit us at the gallery in Hyannis when you go grocery shopping or whatever you are doing. And I would like to thank our technicians that made it possible today. So uh, Vanna Trudeau and Kendra Murphy, thank you so much. Um, and I guess we will end until- Oh, and I see Regina event. Brown. I just want to say hi to Regina, a teacher from my school and in New York. And so seeing her on here is, is, is lovely and exciting. And so that, that's wonderful. One more thing I'm just going to say, my quilts, I call them quilts. And I call them that because I make them look like quilts. My honor, I'm honoring and respecting African-American women and what they did, but I do not like to sew. So I do mixed media collages. So, but I make them look like quilts. So I call them quilts, but they're paper quilts. Thank well, you. Well, they are be beautiful paper quilts. And I see that Karen Watson Edsel went today. She says, we saw the exhibition today. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, so thank you so much, Robin, and thank you, everyone. And You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A bientôt, as they say in French. Yeah, au revoir. A bientôt. Au revoir. <laughs>